I'll just now, I'll just quickly run through the uh, agenda with you and explain how we plan to do it. And then I'll ask Michelle to give a couple of household uh, uh, messages to explain how we're gonna do it. So we'll start off with my introduction, then we'll move on to a set of um, four presentations. First, we'll have a, a keynote presentation by Kristin Meyer, who's uh, working as a program officer in the UNDR, United Nations Disaster Risk. Uh, then we're gonna move on to um, a presentation of a more technical nature by Alice Fenning, who is uh, the nature-based solutions lead in Delta Ares. We'll follow this up with um, a presentation by one of my colleagues, Paul Brotherton, who's our, our program manager for our freshwater programs, and he wants to share with you a, a case study we're working on, which really exemplifies the opportunities and perhaps uh, some of the challenges we need to overcome going forward. And then we're very really pleased and excited to be able to round off the four, session, four presentations with something from Willem Jan Gosen, who is a policy officer in DG Klima, and he's going to talk us through how the EU is working towards this agenda, the opportunities that the different uh, funding and uh, policy areas offer for that. But we don't want to just listen to people um, presenting. We're going to try and uh, build in up to about 40 minutes discussion time. For that, we have a few questions we're going to pose to the speakers to get to go a little bit deeper into what they've been presenting. And then we're going to try and keep about 20 minutes over at the end to look at questions, uh, concerns you might have. Um, so please, um, if you've got something burning and you don't want to forget it, please pop it in the chat. Uh, my colleague Michelle Zheng, sitting off to the right of me, she's going to keep an eye on the chat. And we'll also, depending on interest and how much we have to get through, we'll also take questions direct from the floor. So um, before I quickly turn it over to our first speaker, which will be Kristin, um, let me just pass the mic to my colleague Michelle to give you the, the housekeeping. Hello everyone, thank you so much for attending this session. So we will record the session. If you do not want to be in the video, please turn off your camera. We'll also share today's presentation on our website in the coming week. Um, for the Q&A session, um, you can use the raise hand function in Zoom. When you are called by Chris, please unmute yourself and turn on your camera and briefly introduce yourself, including your name and your organization, and then post a question. If you do not want to be in the recording, please write your question in the chat and I will ask your question for you. Thank you. Okay, so I think we're ready to really uh, make a start. Um, so without further ado, could I ask uh, Kristin, do you wanna share your screen? And then we'll uh, have about 10 minutes to listen to you uh, and what you would like to share with us. All right, for me, that's now visible. So uh, I'll turn my mic off. Sure. Great, thank you so much. Um, and uh, thank you all for, for joining today. Um, as Chris has already said, uh, I'm Kristen Meyer. I'm from the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. And I am also the uh, focal point for nature-based solutions as well as um, anything around water issues. And it's particularly uh, great to come together today on the occasion of, of International Day for Disaster Risk Reduction, which um, as Chris has mentioned, uh, is uh, being celebrated tomorrow. Um, under the theme of fighting inequality for a resilient future. And as we know, nature-based solutions also have um, a role to play in actually making this happen for uh, in an inclusive manner. Uh, in this presentation, I would like to provide you with a, a global outlook and framing of uh, where we stand currently with regards to connecting disaster risk reduction uh, with the environmental agenda. Um, just to get everyone on the same page. As some of you might already be very aware of this, but I thought it would be important for us to um, look again at, at the inherent connections between the two. Um, does it move? Okay, there we go. Um, when we talk about disasters, uh, we often think about how we need to respond and recover after a shock actually happens and, and then look at, again, um, uh, at these kind of issues uh, when the next disaster strikes. But uh, when we talk about disaster risk reduction, we actually want to break out of this uh, vicious spiral and foster preventative actions uh, that minimize hazards, reduce vulnerabilities, 
and as well as exposure, while also increasing the, the capacities of, of people and, and also governments to cope with the risk. Uh, so this is actually where, where nature-based solutions um, can help. Um, but firstly, maybe just a few points on why should we actually think about risk when we're talking about environmental issues. Uh, so one thing is that climate change, environmental degradation and unsustainable practices uh, when it comes also to environmental management are underlying risk drivers um, and they are actually rapidly shifting the risk landscape. And uh, we have seen in recent years that it's actually uh, revealing systemic vulnerabilities in the way that we govern our systems and the way that, that we live. Disasters also reduce the adaptive capacities of ecosystems, um, including to climate change. So we're um, actually on a, on a trajectory where um, ecosystems might uh, uh, reach limits of uh, when they can actually no longer adapt. So it's really expedient for us to, to act. Um, and also not accounting for risk can exacerbate existing risks or even create new risks. risks. And uh, this can also lead to maladaptation. Um, we have seen this in many cases and reduce the ecosystem functions and services um, that, uh, that we would like to, um, to see. Uh, and of course, uh, very connected to the theme of, of the International Day for DRR, disasters can reinforce uh, inequalities and threaten livelihoods, especially where communities depend on environmental resources. So then, there is actually no question for us of, of why we need to work with nature rather than seeing nature as, as the reason for disasters. And nature-based solutions have really a critical role to play in supporting the reduction of existing risks and to prevent new risks through the multiple benefits that they can provide. And also they help us strengthen our social, environmental and economic uh, resilience. They also support proactive actions and if considered in the context of disaster risk reduction can foster risk informed planning and investments, as I will explain um, throughout this presentation. And uh, nature based solutions also have a key role to play in, in infrastructure resilience in particular, and again I, I will uh, refer back to that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, before we move on, I, I, I know that many of you probably know this uh, definition, but I think it's always important for us to remember that uh, we have a definition that was agreed last year at the UN Environmental Assembly, and that really helps to guide our activities around this. Um, and I also think it's important to highlight again that resilience is, is particularly uh, mentioned as well as disaster risk. Um, as, as one of the, the challenges that can be, can be addressed through nature-based solutions. And this is also reflected in, in other global intergovernmental processes that have highlighted the interlinkages between disaster risk reduction, climate change, and the environment and, and biodiversity to achieve resilience, uh, including also through the sustainable development goals. And you're probably also aware of, of all these different uh, frameworks that are that are out there and the different uh, intergovernmental negotiations um, that are happening. Uh, most notably last year, the, the mention of nature-based solutions in the Sharm el-Sheikh implementation plan was, was a really big achievement. Then the adoption of targets eight and 11 of the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework again last year. Uh, also the, the deliberations um, in uh, the UNCCD, as well as uh, related to the Ramsar Convention when we talk about wetlands, they all uh, talk about nature-based solutions. Um, also in the context of the Sendai framework for, for disaster risk reduction, the recently adopted political declaration on the midterm review of the Sendai framework highlights nature-based solutions as a key approach to, to dealing with disaster risks. Um, and we also see the, the G20 being a lot more active as well as um, the water community uh, through the um, UN uh, 2023 water conference that we held uh, earlier this year. Now we have quite a unique opportunity to leverage the momentum that has been created, but we also know that uh, still a lot needs to be done. Um, we, we have the, the definition, we have the framework, but uh, how do we translate this into, into practice? 
And uh, from our perspective as the custodians of the Sender Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, of course, we always refer back to the, the goals and the targets and priority actions that have been agreed by member states uh, in the framework. Now, the Sender Framework, as, as many of you probably already know, recognize uh, that environmental degradation is a major risk driver and that disasters also have an impact on the environment. Uh, it stipulates also that uh, good environmental management is needed to reduce disaster risk and increase resilience. And uh, we believe at, at UNDRR that nature-based solutions are a key vehicle to do so. But still, we, we face quite a number of challenges um, that are related also to the four priority areas that you see on the slide here. Um, and these challenges include a lack of understanding of risk in the context of ecosystems. So what does it really mean to think about uh, risks for ecosystems, but also in terms of risk reduction to work with, with nature? Um, there's also limited uh, or no know-how uh, on how to integrate ecosystem information into disaster risk reduction planning, or also alternatively, how to adequately risk inform environmental resource management, including with, with regards to, of course, water resources and, and integrated uh, management, water resource management approaches. DRR is also too often an afterthought uh, when it comes to investments and um, Often investments are, are geared to, to response after disasters because we don't know if a disaster might happen or not. So sometimes it's not seen as, as financially worthwhile to, to invest in prevention. And also we still face um, the challenge of overlapping mandates and institutional silos that can actually undermine effective risk governance. Now, um, why is this actually particularly important in the context of, of water? We know that nine out of 10 disasters triggered by natural hazards during the last decade were water related. And the data shows um, that devastating impacts on people, ecosystems, and the economy. You can see on the slide some of the numbers. Um, I will not uh, go through them in, in the interest of times, but it's really devastating to see um, the impacts uh, on, on people and, and the planet. And uh, we see actually a particularly striking impact on, on infrastructure. Uh, however, uh, as we will see in, in subsequent presentations uh, from, from my esteemed colleagues today, um, there's enormous potential to address disaster risks through nature-based solutions, as well as hybrid solutions that work with, with the water sector and, and other ecosystems. And I would like to share with you a few opportunities and tools um, that can help us advance uh, nature-based solutions for disaster risk reductions, uh, disaster risk reduction. One opportunity that, that we say see uh, relates to integrating a risk-centered approach into national planning through a comprehensive disaster risk governance approach. Now, um, we think that uh, doing this actually enables exchange of risk information for us to gain better understanding of how risk is related to, to ecosystem management. It fosters a common uh, planning uh, approach on, on disaster risk reduction, climate change, adaptation, biodiversity, conservation, water management, and, and so on, depending on the sectors that are relevant, and it also places emphasis on long-term resilience building. Um, I've, you can see on the slide that I've included a few recent publications um, that, that also help uh, guide policymakers. And it's also worth reiterating that the DRR community and other communities uh, the water community and so on. They have a wealth of experience that is very much relevant and that we should tap into through partnerships. And so on. Um, now, how do we get there uh, to achieve our ambition uh, for a more sustainable, resilient and equitable future? Uh, we also need the right investments. Uh, we're already familiar with many of the approaches that can help us create this future and uh, some uh, uh, the other colleagues will speak to some of these, um, including integrated wetlands as part of natural infrastructure, creating urban wetlands, restoring wetlands, mangroves and peatlands and, and so on. Um, but in terms of really making this happen from an investment point of view, I would like to share with you the experience um, of Canada. So uh, Canada actually found out that uh, there was an increase of disasters by more than 1000%. And uh, this number is really striking. Uh, you wouldn't think that it's that it's that high. 
Um, and this really uh, triggered a substantial investment in, in natural infrastructure as they thought about pathways um, towards a more sustainable future. So they, they found that floods, wildfires, and other hazards caused substantial damage to infrastructure in particular. Uh, so this triggered Canada to consider how to increase the resilience of infrastructure systems, especially with a view to climate-related risks. So then apart from tapping into an existing fund, uh, the Disaster Mitigation and Adaptation Fund, which is worth 3.86 billion Canadian dollars, Canada created a dedicated fund to support natural infrastructure, which is the um, Natural Infrastructure Fund. And this fund is allocating 200 million Canadian dollars to the creation and conservation of wetlands, urban drainage systems, and the restoration of beaches and dunes, and has actually already provided uh, really great results. Um, one of the key success factors uh, of this fund and these initiatives is actually to focus on an inclusive approach and leaving no one behind. And Canada is also sharing lessons learned and experiences uh, to further enhance its efforts on nature-based solutions. And with this, uh, I thank you and I'll hand back to Chris. Thanks very much, uh, Kristen. That was really uh, a great overview of the uh, different policy mechanisms, uh, understanding of where nature-based solutions fit into countering disaster risk um, and a really interesting case actually towards the end on uh, on what's happening in Canada and how they've chosen to approach the increased frequency of risk really startling to think see that they identify a thousand percent increase in these sorts of risks so thanks for that without further ado I want to move along to our, our next um, speaker which is Ellis Penning from uh, Del Tares I think Ellis you're going to take us through a bit more of a, a technical viewpoint of um, what nature-based solutions are and what works and what we know about what doesn't work <laughs> yes in some ways so I, I hand over to you thank you very much and uh, welcome everybody nice that you are here um i want to talk with you about what we need to take into account when we are wanting to use nature-based solutions as part of floods and drought risks uh, reduction strategies so um for that uh First, we have to understand how we're currently dealing with droughts and floods, but also biodiversity loss. Uh, and often this is done in a, in a landscape that is very heavily changed by us in order to uh, facilitate uh, shipping. We have, we have made channels straight, uh, cities are built up, we have intensive agriculture. This leads to several problems and you want to see like, how can we reverse some of these? Um, and often what we're now doing is that we're looking separately to floods or to droughts or to biodiversity improvements. But if we're looking at nature-based solutions, we can actually merge them much closer together because in the end, this is always playing out in the same landscape. And it can be that you might be suffering from floods in the wet season and from droughts in the dry season, obviously. So um, water retention measures are being uh, frequently talked about as one of the uh, various ways that you can work with this. And they are really there to uh, to reduce and mitigate floods and droughts, but also to spread the water availability through time. So basically you get the landscape to act as a sponge. And there's very many different types of measures. I've just collected a few photos of them from all over the world uh, to give you a bit of an inspiration. So it goes from terracing to uh, water retention ponds here in the Eggleston, but also here in Singapore, they have been recreating drains into natural park systems, but it's also in the agricultural domain where you can do different works. Um, a very big example of nature-based solutions that has been implemented in the Netherlands, where I am from, is the Room for the Rivers project. And in that, uh, after two super large floods in the 90s, there was a big uh, discussion on how can we improve our system by giving the river more room again so that when big floods pass by we have space for them so here's one of the measures in the end uh, they, they selected uh, a total of um, 30, 40, 43 different ones but this is one here in the in the southern part where you see that actually they depolded an area so that flood water can really enter in what was previously a polder and thereby alleviate flood in these regions 
but they also took into account the fact that people are living there. So you see the farm there is protected from the high waters. Um, and in the end, what you want to do with these nature-based solutions is also to see if uh, if there's a current uh, rain event, which is expressed here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, in the current situation, such as flood, might really be a very flashy character. So it, because of high runoff, it just goes to a high discharge immediately. And then it will also decrease rapidly again. And what you want to do with nature-based solutions is to see if you can dampen this curve. So can you reduce the peaks, but also can you improve the base flow? Now, this is a, um, a graph that is more from a theoretical point of view, and it's not necessarily uh, clear if this is also feasible in reality. And what we want to do is to get more evidence on that functioning of these measures to improve the sponge functioning of landscape, is how we're calling it. So, a new EU project has been uh, launched uh, 1st of October. Uh, I'm coordinating it. It's called Sponsecapes. And there we really look at the evidence base. So you need to understand both how an individual measure in the landscape is working. How does it absorb water? How can it release water? What are the different technical aspects of that? But also, how does it fit within the larger landscape? Because in the end, you might need to take many different measures altogether in overarching strategies. And then with stakeholders together, you have to select which measure fits where and how do we all do this in a, in a joint manner and selecting the measures that are really uh, welcome to all of them. So for that, you need to also assess both how the primary function of such a measure is playing out. So you evaluate both the technical functioning. So for example, on discharges or groundwater levels, but also on the ecological performance. And ideally, you don't only do that for the current situation, but also on your future climate change analysis. But next to that, the good thing about nature-based solutions, and that's also something Kirsten mentioned, is that there's many co-benefits related to them, but also trade-offs. So for example, related to water quality and carbon sequestration or socioeconomic aspects. Um, we also see it can help uh, in the uh, well-being of humans and in the health aspects. So we need to also take these aspects into account when we're evaluating these measures. And next to that, in order to really select the right measure, we also have to understand the enabling environment. So how are stakeholders engaged? What's the political environment? Is there a will to in include them? Uh, do we need to take into account also uh, aspects of land acquisition or policies and permits and legal aspects? So once you know this for all of the different uh, individual measures, you can then start to combine these into strategies at landscape scale. When we talk about if there is, how well do we understand their functioning, there's actually a lot of evidence specifically for floods. And a lot of that is also uh, in smaller catchments in the UK. For here are two examples where we see reports on uh, that show that nature-based solutions have an effect both on the lag of the peak so how quickly does a peak after rain event uh, passes a point in space and the other is on the left hand side and the other one is a flood peak reduction so how high did the peak come and what we see is that it really depends also not only on the uh, amount of, for example, here there's afforestation, but also on the type of event. And we see that the, this flood peak reduction it is really well measured for the smaller flood events, but for the extreme flood events, the result is much less. So we need to understand when we're talking about this, okay, what is the type of event that we need to manage for? What is the what is the extent that the nature-based solution can actually provide a solution for? And it may be that that is not really all that clear. At the same time, I was also saying when we're evaluating for floods, there might also be droughts in such an area. But we see that there's not that many uh, papers available and evidence available for nature-based solutions on droughts yet. Um, for example, the uh, a moment. Uh, we, we've seen that uh, the, there is examples, especially in the temperate areas of the of our world, but in the other areas, there's not so many recorded cases of success. 
Um, and at the same time, we've just made an evaluation of all sorts of cases available in very many different databases that are reporting on nature-based solution examples. And we see that most of them only, uh, only report an evaluation for either floods or droughts. So for example, there is a really nice website, it is called the Natural Water Retention Measures.eu website. There's 140 examples in there, but only eight of those actually tackle both floods and droughts at the same time. And if you're talking about floods and droughts and biodiversity, it's only five out of the 140. Yet we do know that there are good examples for nature-based solutions for drought available. So for example, here, there is a few uh, with reference to that. We will share the presentation so you can have a look at them later on. And we also do, we have a nice set of tools available that can help us assess the response of such a catchment over time uh, for different types of events. And the modeling tools that are available can give us quite an idea of to what extent nature-based solutions might be helpful. So for example, we had in 2021 summer, a large flooding in the Netherlands, Germany, and Belgium. And uh, in one of the subcatchments of the area where this happened in the Föhl, uh, there was a, a, a town relatively downstream it's called Falkenburg, and you see it was flooded. And there was quite a bit damage in this, uh, in this town. So what we did is that we looked into Okay, what was actually the, the discharge in that uh, during that event? The rain event was quite a heavy rain event. And the blue line that you see in this graph is how the water, the discharge, the amount of water that passed in the city at that at a given event. And with modeling tools, you can really see okay, what happens if I then start to change the land use in my in my catchment, for example. So what would have happened if the whole catchment was an urban catchment? And you see that the discharge with the same amount of rain would have been incredible because there's no water infiltrating into the soil. So you see that the soil in this system is already functioning as a sponge. It already absorbs quite a bit of the water that fell. But you can also say, can I improve that sponge functioning by adding more forests? And here there's three different scenarios of adding more forests. And you see that that not only slows down the peak, but also reduces the peak. At the same time, in the current situation in Falkenburg, the amount of discharge that can run through town at a given point in time is 75 cubic meters per second. So even with our largest nature-based solutions example, for an event like this, we're still nearly not there. So it's good to understand how your system works. And this is more of a sensitivity analysis. This is not validated, but it's more to give an idea of the, the bandwidth of your system. So the main message that I want to give to you today is to, to be aware of telling the realistic narrative when you're talking about nature-based solutions. What event does your solution still cater for? And are there other types of events or scenarios that you might want to evaluate? And what are the co-benefits and costs also related to this? And how uh, do we need to ensure maintenance to ensure their longevity over time? So there's different things. Also, is measure upstream affecting a downstream area and vice versa? What, what is the relation between them? To manage also that expectation. And also to see that nature-based solutions are part of a much larger overarching disaster risk reduction strategy. So in which we're also talking about zoning and building codes. We're talking also about other types of measures like dikes and levees, but also early warning systems in case there is something that we need to do, even when there's more than what you can actually do. I'll leave it with that. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Alice. That was a really great presentation. I'm going to keep us moving. We're running over a little over our planned time collectively. So um, without further ado, I'd, I'd like to give Paul Brotherton the floor. He's a program manager at Wetlands International. And I believe Paul's gonna give us a, a bit more of an in-depth case study uh, of a situation in particular in Germany. But I'll pass over to Paul. Okay, Paul. Thank you. And, and thanks for Ellis and Kristen for giving a lot of helpful context. I'm actually going to, to move us upstream a bit from where Ellis was uh, talking about 
um, to talk about some places where the water was uh, originating. And uh, first of all, I, I want to start off by um, okay, um, by saying what following up on what Chris said that that climate change in Europe is 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 being felt through water. We're seeing impacts from droughts, floods, and fires uh, growing in frequency and intensity. And we're, we're hearing about whiplash effect, uh, prolonged droughts, then sudden. Okay, sorry. Uh, sudden intense rain events. And um, one reason is we're seeing this increase in, in disaster is, is we've lost so much of our, our natural water retention in the landscape. Our, our wetlands are our regulate water in the landscape. And in Europe, we've lost most of them. And um, wetlands are our sponges. And I, I'm going to use that term sponges. I think everyone above a certain age knows what a sponge does. It, it soaks up water and releases it slowly in the landscape. And uh, one disclaimer, here, I, I don't want to say that sponges are a cure-all. Uh, we're seeing these extreme precipitation events that are dumping months worth of uh, rain in uh, a day or two. Um, so, so that is not something that, that sponges can be a cure-all for. But I, I think the, the landscape is an underrated factor in the severity of the floods we're seeing. And so I'm going to move to a, a flood event. Uh, this was in the up in the border of, of Germany and Belgium, where two of the big rivers in Europe originate, the Rhine and the and the Meuse. And what was interesting about this event is it happened in these uppermost catchments. Uh, this is where these rivers really originate, even before the water gets into streams, or if there are streams, they're normally gently flowing in, in the summer. But here, because of this prolonged precipitation event, we had meters high water moving through people's towns and, and houses with a deadly effect. While, while downstream, the main Rhine River was, was hardly affected. And um, our kind of simplified picture of what this up, uppermost catchment looks like is these uh, gently sloping valleys. And you can see the valley bottom has a, a disproportionate regulatory effect on, on, on water retention because it's, it's uh, funnel, the water's funneled down from the, the slopes. And, and here, instead of retaining water, it's funneled downstream as fast as possible off the landscape. And of course, that's when it ended up in, in these towns and, and villages. And um, looking then what this looked like on the ground, uh, we, we did some analysis that, that showed that the, um, these uppermost catchments contributed disproportionately to the, the peak discharge. There was a maybe a narrative afterward that the, the ground was saturated and, and couldn't absorb water. Um, but I, I think what we saw in, in looking at the landscape was that there were a number of factors that were sending water downstream instead of uh, retaining it. Of course, the, the drainage channels directly and, and the roads really became rivers, this network of, of paved surfaces, and also bare soils from crops like maize, where uh, water was running unimpeded off of the, the fields. And um, we, we talk about this area, actually, this upper catchment and headwaters and these small tributaries as, as kind of just right for, for natural sponges. 
It's this uh, middle mountain elevation. And these areas already get a lot of precipitation. And another factor is, is uh, they many of them have a, a lower, gentler slope where water retention measures can be effective. I think anecdotally, I've heard, for instance, that beavers in the North America will, will build dams on slopes up to 13 percent. So you can have gentle slopes and effective natural water retention measures. And it, it just so happened that we um, were doing some modeling in this uh, very area, and we finished a study for the, the European Joint Research Center that modeled some of these uh, sponge effects in, in the micro catchment. And we saw a very strong peak flow reduction at a local level up to potentially 35%. And on the flip side of that um, was a uh, for droughts and higher base flow of more than 10%. And you can also see additional co-benefits here. Uh, water filtration, carbon storage, biodiversity. Uh, again, this is modeling that, that needs to be ground truth, but the uh, the results are very promising, and we think they could apply to a, a large area in these uh, these middle mountains in in Europe. And and this is to show that using this uh, kind of coarse GIS analysis of uh, elevation, precipitation, and slope, we've uh, we've taken a look and, and think that uh, potentially these uh, natural sponge measures in upper catchments can be applied in many places around Europe. And this is to say the sponges can be also applied more broadly, anywhere you have some landscape to work with, you can improve the natural sponge function of that landscape. And, and I will read these here uh, in order to, to maximize the, the uh, potential of soils for absorption and infiltration. It's about blocking drainage channels that, that speed up surface water. It's intercepting rain with rough vegetation. It's ensuring water that reaches the ground can infiltrate. It's holding water and soils and wetlands as long as possible. And if they are uh, coming to the surface, letting them re-infiltrate from paved surfaces, fields and slopes, and also uh, slowing water that comes to the surface and valley floors with vegetation. And this is to, to show really that um, these there are a lot of policies in the European Union that can be partially achieved through natural water retention measures and, and natural sponges, uh, that there are many multi, these are multi-benefit measures. I, I think the, the trick then is how how can we we do this? And of course, we're talking about land use and changing land, existing land use. And in many cases, that land use has economic value. So it's it's a question of how can these benefits of these ecosystem services be realized and um, that the benefits are realized upstream, not only the, the costs. And, and we think the European Green Deal offers many of the, of the right tools, uh, policies and incentives, but, but also that, uh, that Europe is lagging a bit when it comes to adaptation and as a uh, NGOs and, and, and an NGO in the Living Rivers Europe Coalition. I think you'll be hearing more from us on, on more concrete measures for, for adaptation. 
Um, but uh, let's say uh, one big thing is passing an ambitious EU nature restoration law. And I think as we heard in the case of, of Canada, it's treating water as a critical infrastructure. I'm also aware that the, it's happening in, in California. And uh, just to, to skip a bit to what we're actually doing on the, on the ground uh, through Horizon Rewet project. This is on the other side of the border from the, the German Middle Mountains in Belgium where we're restoring the sponge function of an area. And you can see the red checks are areas where we're, we're de-draining and, and slowing flows. And even though this is a, a smaller pilot site, I think it's important to, to showcase and inspire. And, and the, the government of Wallonia is, is already, in Belgium, is already interested in, in upscaling this. And um, we are also involved in a, uh, a sister project to uh, the SpongeScapes that Ellis mentioned. It's called Horizon Sponge Boost with a, a number of partners around Europe where we will have uh, pilot sites where we will try to, to demonstrate these uh, innovative solutions and uh, ins inspire and, and upscale from, from there. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Paul, for that really interesting dive down to some really nice specific case and uh, exploring what was really going on in those terrible floods in Germany and, and really what we've learned from it in, in, in terms of trying to mobilize uh, weapons as nature-based solutions. Um, I want to move on straight away then to, to Willem Jan Gose as our final set piece uh, speech, if you like. Uh, Willem Jan is happily agreed to speak to us a bit on wetlands and climate change uh, and to give it a, a European Union perspective. So um, over to you, Willem. Thank you. And let me check if you can see my presentation well. Do you? You just need to put it in presentation mode. Uh, uh, I think I th oh, yeah, I have to. Yeah. You are screen and then. Uh, down to the bottom mode. yeah that's the one now it should work isn't it that looks good yeah okay great thanks yeah thanks for the, the great presentations i think uh, a lot of introduction has been given uh, i'm impressed um also with paul's presentation with uh, with the results um they are already finding and i know alice is uh, also very active and and I think also at the UN level. So um, yes, it's of course, um, from my perspective, um, working on climate adaptation in the European Commission. Um, I mean, we already, even if the climate wouldn't change, uh, there would be uh, a lot of arguments for restoring wetlands. But if we uh, look at what's coming to us in terms of climate change uh, impacts, the inevitable impacts, then um, we are only at the beginning. And uh, we have reports from, from JRC uh, from a couple of years ago, the Pisita report, which looked at um, the, the major climate threats, including uh, more intensive rainfall or coastal uh, sea level rise impacts and also droughts. And if you look at the, the river flooding and the coastal flooding, the damage and the people exposed already today in Europe, it's quite substantial. But if you look ahead uh, at the three degrees warming, and um, we all know that, 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 uh, that it's regrettably um, still a, a chance that we might end up there, is uh, that you, you have a, a, a strong increase in both damage and people exposed both in river flooding and in coastal flooding. The good news is that if you um, manage to have proper climate adaptation measures uh, in place and you start uh, uh, early with implementing them, you can have a, a substantial reduction both in damage and in, the, in people exposed. So uh, yes, uh, of course we need to um, 
to to invest uh, as much as we can to limit uh, climate change. That's the best thing to do, to limit global warming for a, a number of reasons. But at the same time, there are inevitable uh, climate threats coming to us and we have to be prepared. The same of, is uh, in another report also from the EEA on, on the impacts of droughts. And also there you can see that there is, um, if, if we don't uh, take uh, measures, the impacts will be substantial. So um, already the, the European Green Deal was uh, mentioned several times. Um, the Green Deal, uh, of course, at the heart of the Green Deal is climate mitigation, but it's, it's covering uh, um, almost all physical um, 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 policies uh, coming from biodiversity, from, from clean water, from a uh, circular economy. Um, there are a lot of uh, strategies which binds the Commission, but also a lot of uh, laws have been proposed and adopted. I think uh, we have one more year to go with this Commission, but we're almost there. Um, and, and I think most what was, was promised to be delivered has been delivered uh, over the last four years. One of them is... Um, uh, mentioning, of course, is the climate adaptation strategy, but also the European climate law, which were both adopted in 2021. Um, <clears throat> if I focus a little bit more on the EU adaptation strategy, um, you, um, there you will find we have, we have four objectives. I will not go through them, all of them, but um, if you talk about restoration of wetlands, being an important uh, measure for dealing with both floods and droughts, that's very clear in the in the in the EU adaptation strategy. And um, we we invest in uh, one of the objectives is smarter adaptation. So we need a good knowledge base. And I think already by Alice and and Paul, we heard about several uh, Horizon Europe projects um, already running and just starting up. And, and it is true that we made a, a, a big um, step in further uh, intensifying research in, in the field of climate adaptation, and especially also in the link to, to nature-based solutions, where wetland of, uh, restoration, of course, is an important element. Because we, we recognize that um, having a landscape approach is not only good for climate adaptation, um, for the present, but uh, even more for the future climate uh, threats. But it's also very good for climate mitigation as the carbon sequestration um, could well benefit from it. And so, like I already uh, indicated by, with Paul and Alice, is that um, if you manage to have healthy landscapes, you have, will have more uh, carbon in the soil having uh, so that is a healthy soil and a healthy soil is much better uh, able to absorb um, when there is an intensive rainfall and it will slowly release water uh, as well. Wetlands are of course the the, the name is already um, <clears throat> indicating it well and and yes we lost a lot of wetlands in Europe. Um, I just saw Paul's figure of 35% since 1970, but I, I'm afraid that, that most wetlands were already uh, disappearing in the period before that. And, and I know, for example, in the Netherlands that even along the, the main river systems or main river systems in, in Central Western Europe, we lost uh, more than 90% of the wetlands. And, um, and the wetlands are um, by definition the best uh, also for carbon sequestration. So what we uh, included as well was um, more um, MBS, nature-based solutions. Uh, we stimulate uh, nature-based solutions and we also have uh, addressing to uh, fresh water. So um, here a snapshot, I will not go into detail, but this is uh, all the water-related and MBS-related actions in the EU adaptation strategy. Um, the, uh, there is a very clear link also with disaster risk prevention and management, the theme of uh, also of, of, of today's uh, webinar. 
it's well recognized uh, and we, we really work closely together also with the DG Echo in, in the European level. We are incorporating uh, the climate uh, adaptation aspects in, in the national uh, disaster risk reduction plans. So there is, we are making progress there. Um, and with nature-based solutions, we are assisting member states in the rollout of nature-based solutions. And also we are developing the financial aspects um, because by definition, I think that's one of the challenges or one of the enablers uh, to say is that um, it's very promising from this task, a risk reduction point of view, from biodiversity point of view, from climate point, adaptation point of view, it's very promising to have this landscape approach with restoration of wetlands. However, you need a lot of parties working together and you need a lot of sectors who all have their own um, view on the landscape also to recognize that this comprehensive approach is benefit benefiting them so it's all about working together and scaling up and i think that that's one of the challenges um, <clears throat> i already mentioned the loss of floodplains here you can see for the only the river, the Rhine tributaries in, in, in the Netherlands, which is only a small part, but quite impressive, I always find, is that all the blue zones were used to be the wetlands uh, bordering um, the Rhine tributaries. And if you look at the red lines, that's the, the room for the river they have today. And like Alice was uh, saying, we in the Netherlands made some progress in restoration, but it's 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 still a, a limited uh, area of wetlands reconnected to the river system and and uh, still a lot of potential still there of course a lot of those areas have been uh, nowadays intensive housing and industry and also you can here see in the area of how created new bottlenecks um from the perspective of climate adaptation and, and the landscape approach, the restoration of the sponsor uh, function of the landscape, uh, there are a lot of opportunities. I only like to underline what Alice was already saying is that that... Um, Will you help me? Sorry, to Yeah. We have some strange on the screen, some... some... It's coming yeah, it's oh, it's gone now. Sorry. <laughs> is it? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not so going fun. to read out, read out this, but you, you can see here at least that look if you look at agriculture or you look at the natural systems as so also uh, the forest systems um, uh, but also in cities uh, there are a lot of opportunities um, to to restore the sponsor function there by taking out um, uh, like like uh, paul was already saying uh, taking out drainage is is one of them uh, healthy soils uh, trying to prevent soil erosion so healthy soils it, it's all in there and of course water quality will also uh, benefit from it directly um, I think um, and that was also uh, one of the experiences in the in the in the area of South Limburg uh, where the Falkenburg that they already started a couple of years ago but taking out um, the, the drainage uh, hoses and they immediately saw an improvement of, of water quality in, in the streams uh, at, at the bottom of the valley. And I think these are all uh, great examples, of course. Um, another example I know of is, is also from the, from the Netherlands is that they, but there are a lot of places right now in Europe, they bring back uh, sediment in, in, the, in small streams and then um, those areas uh, originally um, forest uh, bordering the streams, they are used for being underwater for a couple of weeks. And this gives a, an opportunity after intensive rainfall to infiltrate uh, into uh, the aquifers and then releasing water later on. So um, it's very promising. So I'm going to um, my final slides. It is clearly um, 
I think in, in a lot of EU policies, uh, if it's in the, um, in the strategies on the biodiversity strategy in a nature restoration law, which is almost there, but also in, in the laws like the climate law, where we uh, member states are um, compelled to work towards resilience, um, there is almost everywhere a, a clear support for uh, nature-based solutions for, for climate adaptation, but also for other goals. We have a lot of projects and a lot of reports coming out. So I think in the next year, it's all about uh, scaling up and, and uh, getting the work done. Um, we are committed to do so. Thank you. Thanks very much, Willem Jan, for the, the final of the four presentations we, we've had. Now, I see someone giving some applause. I think that's well-deserved to everybody. It's a great set of presentations, thank you. Um, collectively, we have run a little bit longer than we expected, so, but we still have um, 30 minutes to uh, put a few questions to the panel. Uh, I have a few lined up myself, but as I said at the beginning um, to the participants, if they have some questions they'd like to, to put towards the panel, I'll, I'll leave time for that at the end. Um, either you could uh, drop your questions into the chat and my colleague Michelle will keep an eye on that and feed them through to me. Um, or when, when, I, when I get to that, and I suppose that's in about 10, 15 minutes, then um, we open the floor and people can indicate they'd like to speak and I'll, I'll let you take the floor. Um, but whilst um, the rest of the audience are giving this a bit of thought, I'll, I'll throw a couple of questions the panel's way uh, to try and go into this a bit deeper. Um, what I take from it is um, we've moved over the last years from, if you like, a concept that nature-based solutions theoretically could have some added value in the field of disaster risk reduction to some real concrete examples. And if you listen to Ellis, an increasingly nuanced idea of what and how they can be useful and, and the risks and opportunities that presents beyond that, so co-benefits and so forth. I think that's really exciting. It shows an agenda that's really moving over the last uh, five, 10 years. Um, but of course, it's, it's and it was perhaps the, the end comments that Willem Jan put on there about, it's just a question of scaling up. Um, there's a lot of different aspects of uh, scaling up that need to, to work for us. Maybe I wanted to ask Ellis if you could go a little bit deeper in some of what you see that the key enablers we need to move forward with to really start this to accelerate a little bit. I mean, if you look at some of the data we've seen throughout the presentations, um, climate change, of course, is accelerating. The risks from disasters are accelerating. And um, actually, if you read IPCC reports, they say that the window of time that nature-based solutions can play a role is not that big. So what should we focus our attention on going forward? Well, we shouldn't stop. We should not start uh, uh, saying, oh, it's not worth at all anymore. I mean, there's so many, it, it brings so much relief also for the, the, the non-super you know, non extremes. So if you have a flood, otherwise every year in your back garden, you might have them only super occasionally. Um, so also from that perspective, it's also about how, do, how, how does, un hydromorphology event affect people, right? And that, it's good to take it into account. And if you just say, okay, then what can we do with nature-based solutions? I think there is a, a large initiative in the Netherlands called EcoShape, and they define six enablers for nature-based solutions to help implement them and to speed that process up. And that basically says you need to acknowledge that you have good system understanding. Uh, you need to understand the stakeholder domain and have all of them included in that. But you also need to talk about the management and the maintenance because, of course, it is a natural area, so it will develop over time. If you plant a tree, it will grow. So you need to take that into account. And uh, at the same time, it's about institutional embedding. Who is responsible? Who is going to organize all of this? Who are taking the decisions? Who are taking the responsibilities? But it's also about the business case and how you finance it. But uh, also, it's about educating people. And this education is also what we're doing here now. Is it helps to set the ground? It helps to set the dialogue. And I think that when we have this all uh, well arranged, uh, this this really helps us further. I'll put the link to these enablers in the chat so that you can have a, a further look into them and the philosophies behind them. Thanks very much, Ellis. Maybe just to put that out, I think it's really useful that little framework which you you put up and you say you'll drop in the chat. Maybe I could pick on Paul, who's sitting opposite me. I mean, you're, you're looking at quite a concrete case now. You're trying to move on from the, the technical analysis, if you like, the, the showing 
that there is a case for doing work on the ground to try and mobilize it. I mean, what are you experiencing as some of the key enablers that we need to tackle? Well, of course, the like as I mentioned, making sure that it's not only the, the costs that are accruing upstream, but the the benefits uh, as well. And um, I, I think this does getting to the, the funding aspect. And in order to rapidly upscale, we, we need, do need much more investment here. And I think this is a mixture of, of EU uh, funding and and possibly private funding as as well as as there are a lot of sectors and and, and companies who are also have a, a stake in, in this and um, loans and credits of course from uh, institutions such as uh, European Investment Bank. Sorry about this, everyone. It's a bit more of a fiddle when Paul speaks. Um, so Paul's zooming in a bit on, on the investment needs. Um, I think that's an interesting perspective. I know uh, it's a key part of the story. Um, just checking the time. I want to then, I'm going to jump around on different themes here, and then we see what we get back from the floor. And another aspect that we've, we've been thinking about is, um, and it aligns very much with um, the International Day for Disaster Risk Reduction. There's a focus upon uh, inequality. Um, and I wondered if if um, Willem would have some sorts of perspectives on how that applies in Europe. We, we, the idea of inequality and in fact the statement from um, on the Disaster Risk Prediction Day was in fact that it's not just poorer countries whose inequality uh, increases the risk to disasters, it's also in richer countries and, and that relates to different regions and different contexts. And what is there that we can really do about that to, in, in Europe to try and help discriminate where we need to invest the most, perhaps. Yes, uh, thank you. And no, I think it's an, an important issue. Um, I think it, it, it was on the minds uh, at, at the European policy level, for sure, from the beginning. I mean, the, if you look at, at the start from the Green Deal, it, it, it's one of the core principles. But I see over the last period uh, increasing attention to, to this aspect which might of course well be that we, um, I think all of us, we are, um, uh, yeah, regrettably, we see so many uh, uh, weather extremes and climate extremes over the last years. And you, you can see on the ground that um, the ones who are more living in, in poor housing quarters or uh, don't have, have the means to deal with uh, extreme uh, heat waves uh, because they are living in houses not well uh, fit for for uh, keeping out high temperatures this is this is a, a, an important topic so so yes it needs to be considered anyway uh, and i think what what is interesting if you look for example you always have to be become specific so for example if you look at cities and cities are, of course, uh, hit by several um, weather extremes, uh, for example, heat waves and intensive rainfall. If you take both of them, um, the heat waves, uh, they um, can be reduced the impact because you have you have the, the, the heat island effect. So in cities, the temperature can be several degrees even higher than the surrounding area. So if you have a lot of trees, uh, high uh, trees with a lot of, of shade, and you have enough water in, in your soil so that there can be evaporation during, during the, the, the hottest uh, period of the day, you can reduce the temperature by a number of degrees. So, uh, and these are a type of nature-based solutions, or you, at least you, re, you make sure that the natural uh, functioning of your system in the city or just near the city is functioning well, and that will benefit all, um, uh, so all living in 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 the areas. But uh, of course, you, for example, in housing areas, um, it, it it is up to the to the local government to really start planting trees now, so that in 10, 20 years from now they are grown grown trees and there will be enough shade. Um, 
for the future uh, heat waves, which for sure uh, will be uh, upon us. So these are just a few examples. I wonder if I could just bring Kristen in on that point as well, um, because of course it's the key part of the International Day. And uh, maybe you'd like to also reflect upon uh, how we can try and improve the way we um, address inequality and the way we tackle disaster risk. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, for from our perspective, what is inherent in, in the Sender framework is that uh, we need to take a whole of society approach. So that includes everyone. And uh, we put particularly emphasis on um, disaggregating data and understanding the impacts on, on women, um, disabled people and other vulnerable groups. Um, so we're, we're trying to, to understand um, how, how to better cater to those groups and how to include them in, in uh, different processes. One of the projects um, that we are currently uh, implementing is actually a, a Dutch um, um, a, a Dutch commitment under the Water Action Agenda um, that looks at uh, how local communities can be more involved in uh, coming up with the right kind of climate adaptation strategies uh, through the water sector. And it really builds on, on getting the local community involved uh, from the beginning in, in the design of these types of strategies and also to understand more how, uh, how they are impacted by different types of, of, of risks and hazards. Um, so I think this is, is the way forward, how, how we should work um, to really take our global thinking and those kind of um, tools and, and methodologies that we have down to the local level and uh, apply them in, in the contextual manner. Um, yeah, that would be maybe an example. Thanks very much, Kristen. I think that's really, I, I'd like to go into that more and more, but I think I have to keep, uh, <laughs> there's different topics also come up in the chat. Um, maybe we could return and that aligns with a couple of the questions I see coming in the chat back to the issue of finance. I see we have Catherine McSweeney from European Investment Bank here um, and she has a question it's directed at Willem. Uh, you mentioned uh, finance for nature-based solutions but what do you or, or need in case the, the commission envisage being put in place in terms of finance for nature-based solutions and by whom and by when? Yeah thank you and um, actually um, it is the Commission uh, who, who is working together with the European Investment Bank uh, exactly on, on this uh, topic as well. I think they, they just presented before summer a very interesting overview of uh, investments taking place at, right, at this moment in, in nature-based solutions and um, also involving climate adaptation. One of the outcomes uh, I learned is that that it's I think more than 95% of the investments are made by public authorities, and if you think about it, that is very likely um, continuing to be the case. Uh, so that that's good to realize because, um, of course, we have to look for opportunities where where um, private investors can step in, but then then they often they need a very clear. A uh, picture of what is the project, when I invest, what will be the return on investment, etc. And um, it, it would be great if we could uh, develop projects uh, on nature-based solution and, for example, restoration of, of landscape to such a degree that, that investments are clearly going to be um, a clear uh, return on investment. Um, but at the same time, um, we, then we have to look at biodiversity gains. How do you translate that there is a lower risk of flooding or that there will be more water uh, available during dry season? So we have a challenge there. What I found also interesting is that we have had contact with some uh, companies who are um, uh, making uh, or they are collecting drinking water and selling it. So it's this is more the international, uh, multinational uh, companies. And I was really surprised uh, or, or to some extent pleasantly is that they were, um, because of that, they were considering the whole area um, which is influencing uh, aquifers. And, and then they start realizing how important it is to invest, to make sure that there is no pollution, that there is enough clean water, et cetera. 
which is, I think, exactly what, what we are striving, uh, public authorities are always striving to, to arrange as well. So we are all in it, in the same endeavor, uh, how to, to, um, to get it financed. And uh, actually, I think we, we still need a lot of work to make sure that we, it gets easier to make fin financial arrangements. But at the end of the day, it's very much like Alice was, uh, I think, describing in her enablers, list of enablers. At the end of the day, it's the people who are um, the authorities from different levels, but also the different sectors. They need to sit around the table, get to know each other, get to know um, what, they, what, what their interest is um, and how it is uh, threatened by by climate change threats or by other um, by other risks and they need to work together and invest together to to make these solutions possible well, that's a really great and comprehensive answer and you you've probably answered quite a bit of what uh i think christophe etienne was asking uh, it was also in line with how do we finance to scale up so above and beyond what the eu might be doing which was um catherine sweeney's question um, does it, any other panel want to comment upon that? I mean, I think it's a nice starting point you put there um, that actually finance is finance, but uh, when, that happens better when you're starting bottom up and talking to the different actors and stakeholders involved. Would any of the other speakers like to jump in, maybe elaborate further or, or give an example? Maybe I um, can jump in on, on two points. I think on, on the financing part, um, it's worth highlighting again what... Uh, member states have agreed on in the global biodiversity framework last year there um, is there are two targets that are relevant one talks to um, de-risking investments and risk disclosures to understand more where where do the risks actually sit and, and what impact do they have on on biodiversity and maybe we can utilize that discussion also towards how we invest in in nature-based solutions the other one focuses on um perverse incentives and freeing up funds um, through changes in regulation that actually reduce the number of perverse investments. And the number that is quoted in the global biodiversity framework is $500 million that could be freed, freed up uh, just by, by changing um, regulatory frameworks. So it would be really important to look into, into current legal systems um, across different types of sectors that are relevant for nature-based solutions. Uh, the other point on bringing different actors together and building that common understanding to make those solutions happen in, in real life, um, as, as UNDR, we are promoting, of course, I mentioned this in my presentation, comprehensive risk governance which actually means in a nutshell to really bring um, the right uh, kind of stakeholders together. We're already doing this in, in the climate space between climate change um, goals and strategies and, and um, disaster risk reduction strategies to promote common planning of rather ha than having separate strategies that don't speak to each other to come together and to have one plan that speaks to both climate goals and disaster risk reduction goals because we know that these are very much uh, interlinked and and impact one another and uh, we're now also working on seeing how do we bring the the planning aspects around uh, biodiversity into this as well we know that uh, countries are currently working on updating their uh, national strategies and action plans on biodiversity so what opportunities do we have now at this time also to make those linkages that go back to what has been agreed again in the global biodiversity framework um, on on these linkages between biodiversity disaster risk reduction climate change and uh, different types of sectors including the water sector and in the context also of nature-based solutions so yeah I just wouldn't, wouldn't like to encourage also all of us to to maybe leverage the momentum that we have at the moment and the opportunities we have for a revision of, of current policies and to to start promoting more this this comprehensive risk governance approach. Thanks. That's a really uh, great answer, Kristin. I just saw Paul was wanted to Come jump in, in. Uh -huh. and I want to see if we've got anybody who'd like to speak from the floor. I don't see too many questions in the chat, so if you quickly just you, 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 you want to respond, respond to the finance issue. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad to hear Kristen uh, mention the harmful subsidies aspect um, from the NGO perspective. This is very important. We we still have a lot of uh, the wrong incentives out there that are harming water quality, uh, groundwater depletion, uh, river morphology. So so that is key. And um, since I've been talking about sponges, I I do want to. Uh, tease maybe a, a sponges finance facility uh, along the lines of the EU investing more of its budget in uh, biodiversity and, and climate uh, funding instrument uh, through the uh, EU multiannual financial framework or a, a restoration fund, but uh, a more of a, a dedicated fund that can invest in, in wetlands, uh, floodplains, and um, natural water retention measures. Thanks, Paul. Well, um, Jan might want to jump in there, but maybe I'll just first of all give uh, people the floor to see if anyone would like to ask a question directly. So um, if you've been hanging on for this moment to speak up, please do uh, jump in. Together with Michelle, I'll try and track, just raise your hand. Um, I see one on the agriculture by Alfred de Jager. Yeah, hello. <laughs> I'm Alfred de Jager of the Drought Observatory of the jo Joint Research Center. And I do follow this kind of initiatives already quite a long time. And I like it. It's important. But uh, like I said, the landscape is 70% in agricultural use. So if we want to do something on the landscape, yeah, some some trees in cities are also nice to have, <laughs> but it's not cooling down your landscape. <clears throat> so one way or another, we have to work on the agriculture. That's, let's say, the, the difficult part. And I think we still avoid that. Of course, it is difficult, so I can understand it also. So I would rather say <laughs> the ambition that we should have is, okay, how are we going to green the center of Spain? what is needed in order to do that. Uh, uh, what are the political consequences of that? Um, we must really set a high ambition, integrate the peripheric areas. I really don't care about the cities, in, to, to be bold, <laughs> okay? Where, where, the, where we have a chance of making a difference just because of the numbers that are important. Okay, so it's really nice to have uh, some more space for rivers in the Netherlands, but I mean, <laughs> it's it's not making a difference. It will not save my glaciers here in the Alps. That in the end also will uh, provide your problems in the Netherlands in the in the long run. So we must really have a a landscape point of view, and the landscape is seventy percent agriculture. So it is reconciling the agricultural practices with nature. And uh, that is a, a hell of a job, but that should be the focus, I think. Also of all the projects, if we want to scale up, we must go to that and set big ambitions. So I want to reforest the Greek islands, make a Spanish province green again. We do those things in Brazil, we do those things in Ethiopia and we don't do it in Europe. And I think one of the problems is that the projects that we defined are always projects that are only accessible for people with having a lot of financial backgrounds. How can I say that? Those are not the peasants in Sicily. Okay, so we the target of the project should be the people who actually work on the land. Okay, and not the fancy consultants in the big cities. Because those will make no they will make a new sewage system, plant some trees in their beautiful city, and they think that that is the world. No. Not. So that is, I think, the hard message. So we have to convert from a focus on the cities, on the natural areas, as we call them, 
back to the landscape, to the farmers, and manage to reconcile them with nature. So that the sponge is, is of course, not a little wetland somewhere isolated. The sponge is the big field where we grow corn or, or mice. Okay, that is where you conserve the water. Also, the, the solutions or the, the, the issues you showed in the Eiffel disaster and the Ardennes disaster, they all originate on the agricultural practices on the flat on the flat plain on top of the hill. So that's why we got the disaster in the valleys. Yeah, Alfred, I think I think it's a great yeah. point well made. It, it's a sort of a elephant in the room about scale and, and impact, yeah. isn't it? And um, yeah. and who you really need to be working with. Um, I think it might be interesting to because we are coming towards the end of time. If if we gave the panelists, the presenters, the chance just to respond to that, because I think it is a. It's a question I always come up against. It's, it's nice to be innovative and show you can do things uh, with innovation funding and show that potentially, but it's really how do you reach that sort of scale to make a difference? It's yeah, a big can question. I, can I just as a final response? I, Alfred, I totally agree with you. And um, I, I think it's really important that we realize that this is a, a joint effort. And in that, the, the multi so the, from the six enablers, the one on the multi stakeholder is important in that, but also the educational part. And I do think that it will really help if we do more on that together with farmers to let them experience what is possible and how they can contribute as well and how they can make an impact that also benefits them and to show that where are the benefits, where are the win-wins for, for all of them. And well, well, maybe there are no financial or immediate benefits, but still you have to convince them. Yeah. Okay, because I think thinking also in terms of stakeholders, then already you will lose that public. They are not stakeholders. They are not used also to go to meetings. They just work on their field and they sell their chickens or whatever. No? So they, they might have representatives in the cities, but they still not do the work. So we have to find a way to reach out to the people who actually work on the land. And they will not. Have, they they don't like meetings. That's why they choose to work on the land. Okay, so that that is giving this this enormous problem that we have in really implementing and scaling up our work because the people actually doing the work, they don't go to meetings. They don't understand European funding systems. They just are there in the field or doing their thing. Okay, let's, let's keep uh, Sorry, Alfred, it's a, it's a great point. We could have given you a, a slot, actually. But I think I want I want to wrap up on time, and that means giving, uh, I, I promised the other speakers just to respond to your point. But uh, very briefly, I'm looking across at Paul. Paul says no. Willem Jan or Christian? Yeah, yeah, maybe briefly. But I think uh, when we discussed this topic, it was meant to cover all. So uh, for clear the agriculture area, and I don't think we should, at this stage, choose between uh, are we going to invest in, in an area which is uh, urban or semi-urban or not. I think we have to do it everywhere. Um, I think uh, from, from the EU perspective, uh, we did, uh, we worked very hard together with DG Environment that, for example, in the, in the common agricultural policy, we offer member states opportunities to use funding for making the, the landscape resilient. And what is very striking is that a lot of member states don't use all that money. So they choose to do it differently. And my experience is, I, I don't agree with the picture you say with the uh, farmers uh, working on their own, not working together with all of them. I think if there's one uh, group who's very well organized at local and regional level, it is agriculture. But I'm with you there that uh, we need a lot of discussion and, and on what is coming to them. And they are the first to experience that the climate is changing. And I think there, there is now a rapid change in their perspective that they see there is a, ch an, a change is needed. But we, I'm, I'm, we need to help them with very specific opportunities. So how can you how can we in, incorporate uh, a different use of the agricultural land? How can we uh, make sure that there is no over exploitation of water on the short term? 
and we need a lot of energy and cooperation, I think, to make this transformation. But um, it, for sure, agriculture needs is one of the major players to, to make this, this different approach. And they sometimes they have to step back. And I think they start realizing that wetlands maybe are not, uh, that they need to be in, in the landscape as well so that they benefit uh, also from the agricultural production and in the long term. That, that would be my take. Thank you. Yeah, if I, if I can comment on it, Chris, um, after the big droughts, sorry, your mic is off. After the big droughts in France in last year, the main reaction of the agricultural community was to make enormous reservoirs in order to continue business as usual. And of course, for me as a scientist, I know those reservoirs will evaporate all the water that you then extract from your wetland. So I think at the end of the day, we have an enormous job we have. in order to, to explain how the world really works to these people. And that's, that is, is, is basically where we have to engage in. That is, that is the problem, I think. And therefore, I would plea for really a lot of example projects, maybe starting small in the agricultural landscape, showing showcases where people can understand, okay, this is a benefit and I don't have to adapt that much my practices in order to start working on it. We have to get them along and, and for that, yeah, we, we have to be much more creative, I think, in, in that sense. And have really, it will go off the focus on the urban areas because they just get too much attention. I think the fact so. I, I really have to cut you. Yeah. Um, I, I've just checked with Kristen. She'd like to come back with one more comment and then I think I need, I need to wrap up. But I mean, it's a discussion we can, of course, continue outside the, the seminar if we want. Um, uh, Kristen. Please go ahead. Yeah, it's a it's a very interesting um, discussion, and and we're also thinking about what um, does sustainability mean um, also in the context of slow onset events, which of course also impact agriculture in in particular. But maybe to take it back to a, to a broader kind of idea that was shared recently in the in the presentation um, by Professor Pertner, who was a co chair of the uh, working group number two for the IP, IPCC. Um, sixth assessment, and he was presenting this this more positive idea of how can we connect through a mosaic of different solutions, um, ecosystems, again, in a way that um, you have this whole landscape approach. And that should include, of course, also cities in terms of how do we connect them back to other areas around, surrounding cities and how can we use this kind of mosaic and, and corridor and connectivity thinking to help us um, build a network of solutions that has a much bigger impact in, in the long term. Maybe I'll just leave you with that. Uh, I can drop in the chat a really uh, interesting article that, that they wrote about this if you want to read up a little bit more. Thanks very much, Kristen. And with that, uh, I'm afraid I have to wrap up the, the webinar. We we're actually losing uh, participants as we speak. We're a few minutes over. Um, first of all, I wanna thank the, the speakers Thanks for putting the time in to make such thought provoking and interesting presentations. I think it's really driven a, a great uh, session, which has really explored in a short time, most of the key issues that need to be tackled to, to really scale up uh, wetlands as nature-based solutions. I think for me, I take away, it's clear from, from research and, and principle that wetlands have their place in, in this uh, solution, but yeah. The policies and the policy drivers seem to be in place somehow. There seems to be in technical organizations interested in this and understanding, but we've got a way to go to really get it moving at scale. Uh, Alfred's comments really show you that. It's, um, we're still rather nibbling at the edges. Certainly finance seems to be an issue, um, amount and um, the type of finance, but um, perhaps what I take away more than anything is really to get down on the ground and talk to people. Um, if people understand what can be done to help avoid these sorts of issues where they're short or long-term floods or droughts, then people will tend to try and find a way to work together. And maybe that's where we need to crack a few nuts. Um, I can talk a lot about it as well, but I, that's a little bit my take home from this. So without going on too much further, let's um, say thank you once again to all the speakers. And yeah, 
the presentations will be, be made available for you afterwards if you like them. And um, let's keep talking and working. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, colleagues from Wetlands International for organizing. It's very great. Thanks, everyone. And well, whilst there's a few people, thanks to Michelle, because she organized all of this, including sorting our last minute technical problems. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Yeah, thank you. It was really nice. Um, We're all happy? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I am. <laughs>